Uh, so there's also that use of this, which we used a lot. We started off with four hydraulic conductivity parameters, ended up with nine, and that was achieved largely by this kind of analysis, as well as by model fit arguments and also prediction interests. Okay, <laughs> number five <laughs> is use prior information carefully, and I'm going to say a few more things about that. Notice I say use prior information carefully. I don't say don't use prior information, okay? Prior information, uh, first of all, what is prior information? Prior information penalizes estimated parameter values that are far from the expected value. Okay, so it's what, we, what you do there is you take that information from the, hydrolo the hydrologic and hydrogeologic information and use that to say what you expect the parameter values to be, and then you penalize the regression if it moves those values too far away from those expected values. Okay, but where do we get those expected values? Again, we get them from this box, but the information in this box was just the information that when we use it to produce a model, and can test against it, it often doesn't do well, okay? So the thing is, you just want to make sure, if you really, you, before you de start depending on this data a lot, just make sure that, just think about it, do it carefully. Okay, six is assign weights that reflect measurement error. And I'm going to say a few things about that. Um, first of all, I'm putting measurement here in quotation marks. And that's because it's sort of measurement error in the broader context. You have to take account of that you're, you're, you're taking this measurement and comparing it to this model, OK? And so it might not just be the analytical measurement of how, clo how good was my tape, OK? Or how well did I get the elevation of that well? Also, for example, in this situation, there are places where the hydraulic gradients are very steep. And when we compare that to the model, sort of our register only has to be off a little bit, and we can, we can get very big errors. Um, and so that kind of thing might be taken into account. And you kind of get into an argument of, well, what's model error and what's measurement error, and that's all involved here. There's some kind of model errors that as long as they're random with a mean of zero, they can be included in the same structure. Okay, but why is it important to think about errors in this way? First of all, it's it's required for common uncertainty measures to be correct. All models, um, regression models, will calculate um, a standard deviation of the prediction for you, okay? And it will be done using this equation, okay? The the, um, the, that V of B is the variance covariance matrix of the parameters, and the diagonal of that matrix are the variances of the, of the estimated parameters. You take the square root, you get the standard deviation. Um, and it's always calculated in this way. But this equation's only valid if the weights have been assigned with at least an attempt to make them reflect this measurement error, okay? Otherwise, otherwise that's not the right equation. In fact, it can be hugely off. There are a bunch of other terms you'd have to add that nobody has the slightest idea how to get, okay? Um, so this equation's only valid if the weights reflect this measurement error. The other thing is that if you change the weights by orders of magnitude, you can get anything you want, okay? And so that the regression really becomes both difficult and it really loses a lot of meaning. And to think about how that works, consider this. This is a linear regression um, where x is our independent variable, y is our dependent variable, and we have a bunch of observations, okay? And most of our observations here are from small values of x and we have one for a large value of x, and our prediction is for a large value of x. And this is analogous in groundwater flow, to, to my mind, to the situation where we have a lot of hydraulic heads, say, and one flow, or just a bunch of flows, like we have here. We have 16 flows and 501 heads. And we're trying to say something about transport. Well, should we just really weight those flows, you know? How important are the heads? And, you know, so there's that argument that goes around. Um, um, it's basically, can we improve the accuracy by weighting that one observation that we have for large values of x more heavily than the other ones? Okay. Um, and the answer is no, both if the model is correct, and if the model isn't correct, you don't increase the weighting, you try to fix the model, okay? And the other data are important. So basically, in the groundwater example, if you want to put a big weights on the flows, you have to convince yourself that the heads aren't really telling you anything you want to know about the system, okay? And I think that's a hard sell in groundwater, personally, because the, the heads are basically telling us what channels the flows are occurring in. So if we don't care how the water gets to the spring and all we care about is that it gets there, fine. But I don't think that's usually what we want. Um, okay. 
Okay, seven is encourage convergence by making the model more accurate. That's essentially a, re a frustration reduction guideline. Um, this is nonlinear regression, and nonlinear regression is hard. Um, I was at a conference some years ago and was a group of senior um, statisticians. Um, I was quite junior, and I was listening to these people, and somebody mentioned nonlinear regression, and they all groaned. <laughs> and, and, and really, it's just nonlinear regression is hard, and there's a lot of the time when you're doing calibration with nonlinear regression that doesn't converge, but you still have sensitivities, you still know something about your model fit. Um, there's a lot of information from this process that you can still use to keep going, and so this is just to try to encourage people to do that. Okay, model testing. Um, there's just one point on evaluating model fit. It's obviously a very big topic, and there's just one point I'm going to make. This is a commonly used kind of figure, okay? It's basically simulated versus observed. And if you draw a one-to-one -one line there, one hopes that your data li line up around that, okay? And here I've, uh, I've plotted the, f the uh, information related to flows and heads for this uh, model. And you can see that there is some kind of problem here. But it's hard to figure out how significant that is from this plot. And so I'm going to suggest an alternative. Oh, one thing is I've weighted them here, um, partly because like some of the flows are like 120,000 cubic meters per day, and you just got to weight them to get them on the same plot. Um, <coughs> um, OK, let's consider an alternative. Let's keep weighted simulated on the bottom here, OK? But instead of plotting weighted observed, plot weighted observed minus simulated. So just the difference. So we're not adding anything to this plot. And this is what you get. Okay, one thing is it spreads things out. It makes the difficulties more obvious, which is maybe why people use the other plot. I don't know. But, and <laughs> the other thing is you can quantify things and, and really figure out uh, how important this is. And this does require a little bit of statistical knowledge. Um, here each line is, is plotted as being three standard deviations of, of, the, of error, of the regression error. Okay, and if these were normally just random and normally distributed, I would expect no more than one or two of these points to be outside that. Clearly, that's not the case. And so this clearly, and also the flows are in a different direction than the head. So clearly, there are some difficulties with this model. There's some bias in this model. Um, and this makes it really obvious. Okay, nine is evaluate optimized parameter values. Again, I'm going to say a couple of things about that. Um, in evaluating optimized parameter values, one of the most useful things you can do is use them to test m for model error, okay? You can actually take those best fit parameter values and test for model error. And the reason you can do that is that the regression is a mathematical formulation that has um, no understanding of the physics of your system. It will estimate negative Ks if it thinks that will produce a better fit. It's just, it's sort of a very objective uh, evaluator of your model and your data. Um, yet, if you have certain characteristics, you expect certain things. If you have adequate data that you've correctly interpreted so that the simulated value you have is truly what you should be comparing to that observed value, and if the model correctly represents the system, then you expect certain things. Okay? And one of the things you expect is that estimated parameter values should be reasonable. Okay, and that where reasonable is being determined again by that hydrologic and hydrogeologic data that's related to model inputs. So it's a way of using that data that's a little less stringent, quite a bit less stringent than using it as prior information. So it's still coming into the analysis just in a different way. And, and or the 95% confidence intervals should include reasonable values. So if these th things are contradicted, if you have an estimated value that's 15 orders, you know, even three orders of magnitude too high, you can do, two th you can do a couple of things. You can slap prior information on that thing, okay, so <laughs> to get it back down. Or you might go back and say, gee, maybe, maybe I've got a problem, okay? And obviously the latter one, I think you can, is, you can never prove these things mathematically, but, but should lead to a more accurate model. The other thing you expect if these two things are true is that weighted residuals should be random. I wasn't going to get into that, but that is sort of the, com that, that's the complete set of expectations you would have given those two things. Okay, I'm now going to just jump on down past all these and go to number 14, formally consider desired predictions. <clears throat> 
The prediction of interest in this model is, is transport. Ideally, that would be transport that included dispersion and adsorption and the fact that there's fractures there and everything. But this is a large regional model. Um, and our thought was that what we could best evaluate would be advective transport. And we're not going to deal with the fact that some local fracture in some cases might be dominating things. But in general, we're going to look at the, 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 the regional processes and effects that might be, coming, be exerting themselves in that location. Um, so we're just going to look at advective transport for the sites of interest, which we evaluated 14 underground testing area sites in Yucca Mountain. Um, we introduced uh, generally several particles in the area. This is one as an example, and advected just that particle. And we advected it in its three coordinate directions, excuse me, um, uh, which in the way this grid is oriented, it's north, south, east, west, and vertical. Um, and I'm going to show you results just from one of those directions. <coughs> So we're going to, the guideline is formally desired, uh, considered desired predictions. And again, we're going to look at this sequence. We're now finally to predictions, and we're going to look at the impacts of observations and parameters as related to those using the model that, is, that we have. We're going to address the following, uh, following questions. Given the, again, given the model that we have, what parameters are important to predictions? Are parameters important to predictions supported well by the observations? Which of the existing observations are important to predictions? And what new observations would be most valuable to predictions? So those are just four questions that might commonly come up. OK, what parameters are important to predictions? Here again, I'm going to define a sensitivity statistic. Um, it's prediction scaled sensitivity. Again, there are other people who have done similar things, but um, this is how I'm scaling it. This is, the Z prime is the simulated prediction. And we're taking the derivative to get uh, the sensitivity. Um, and we're, we're scaling it in this way so that the prediction scaled sensitivity is here is defined as the percent change in the predicted value given a 1% change in the parameter. And one of the reasons we do that is that that allows us to get a value for porosity. Okay, and basically the value is 1. And I thought that it was uh, in all very likely that porosity would be the most important parameter in this system. Um, and indeed, it, it, it wasn't. Um, there, this is vertical advective transport from one particular location. The range of lines here reflects the, the fact that there were a number of particles introduced at this location. So that we wanted to make sure that just a little bit difference in where a particle started didn't produce a big difference in the evaluation. Um, and we can see that there are some recharges that are important, um, and especially because it's vertical transport, that makes sense. Um, there are some hydraulic conductivities that are important, um, and then there are some other parameters. And there are some parameters that are distinctly unimportant. Okay, um, and to some extent, this gives a measure of desired model complexity. Okay, given our parameter of, or given our prediction of interest, these are the things, these things are the things about the system that we would like to know about the most. And these other things are things that aren't as important. Now, an obvious thing then is to take this kind of analysis and combine it with the composite scale sensitivities we saw before. And we're going to do that to answer the second question. Are parameters that are important to the prediction supported by the observations? And we're going to use composite scaled sensitivities as a measure of the information on the parameter. So if we have a small composite scaled sensitivity, we don't have much information. And we're going to use prediction scaled sensitivities to indicate the importance of uh, the parameter to the prediction. Okay. And we're going to be in trouble when we have a small composite scaled sensitivity for the parameter, so we don't know anything. Okay. But we have a large prediction scaled sensitivity, which means we need it. And so you can take these two figures we have and go back and forth in the comparisons. And you can see that um, K1, we have a little less information on. These two would do pretty well. Um, some of the recharges are difficult. Um, and of course, porosity is a problem. OK, and we can see how much. OK, we can also take it one step further. Let's say, for example, that K4 was important, which it's not. Okay. <laughs> so 
K4 isn't, <laughs> isn't important, is it gonna happen again? <laughs> okay, we could go up to the composite scale sensitivity and say, well, we have a fair amount of information on that, so that one's okay. But let's go one step further. Let's see what our support is. And if we went back to the dimensionless scaled sensitivity, we'd go, oh gee. Yeah, it's, those four wells are really important. Maybe I really better check those, because now I know that they're important to our predictions. So you can take it all the way back. Okay, the last two questions are which existing, for uh, formally considering the desired predictions, are which existing observations are important to predictions, and what new observations would be most valuable to predictions. So you're going all the way from this end, the observation part, to the prediction part. Now really with the, our dimensionless composite and prediction scaled sensitivities, we did travel that path, but that analysis pr produces a lot of plots. Okay, I showed you just a limited number, but for every observation, you would have plots for every parameter, and it ends up being a lot. Um, so it would be, and also the a problem with that is, at least if you use the sensitivities, you haven't included the effects of parameter correlation. Um, so we're going to, to take these same measures, the same kind of information, but bring them into one statistic that addresses those problems, produces a single statistic that makes it easier um, to evaluate and also account for the parameter correlation. And we're gonna do that by using the standard um, equation for prediction standard deviations. It's just the linear equation for that. Um, so the S sub Z is the stand prediction standard deviation. Um, and what's included in that equation are, is this X transpose omega X, and the X's include the sensitivities related to the observations. Um, the X of, and the weights, the do, omega term includes the weights. So those are the same kinds of things that came in um, for the composite scale sensitivities. And then the XZ rela is related to the sensitivities for the predictions. Um, so we have all our elements in there. <coughs> this, that equation reflects uncertainty in the estimated parameters, not in other aspects of the model. So all we're looking at is the estimated parameter values. Um, and we calculate these standard deviations for movement in the three coordinate directions for each of our, our advective travel paths. So here we have the same path we saw before with the standard deviations constructed on top of them, just to give you a feel for what that is. So what are we gonna do with this? We're gonna use it to uh, calculate something called, we're gonna call the observation prediction statistic, OPS. Um, and here's the same equation you just saw. And what we're gonna do is remove or add observations from this middle part of the equation, okay? We can remove observations just by setting a weight to zero. And we can add observations if we can calculate the sensitivities, okay? And if we can, say, if we can assign a weight, if we can say something about how uh, accurately we think we can measure something. And so that produces a statistic that looks like this. So we've in some way or another manipulated these, okay? Notice that S squared, which is the only thing here which reflects model fit and includes the actual measured value, um, hasn't changed. We're assuming that the, S, the variance that we've estimated through the regression is our best estimate of the variance in the system. So we've kept that the same, okay? But we're gonna manipulate the equation so it divides out because again, I want something that doesn't include model fit because for new observations, I don't have an observation. Okay. And that's done by producing this observation prediction statistic. I'm gonna take the difference between these, divide by the first one, multiply by 100, and get a statistic that is, it can be thought of as the percent increase in the standard deviation or the uncertainty given um, that I've omitted something. Okay, or added, or the percent increase if I've added something. We're gonna use this now to address the first, this uh, third of our questions, question C, which existing observation, um, observations are important or not to the predictions? Okay, and in this case, we're evaluating the 501 hydraulic head observations. Um, and the map shows you which ones, based on the analysis, but just omitting one at a time, which ones are most important, which ones are least important, and then the green ones are in the middle. Um, and one of the things this figure shows is that observations outside of the test site are very important, and there was a lot of debate about that. There were people at DOE who weren't convinced that they needed to go very far outside of the test, the test site to get measurements that would be relevant. So the hydrogeologists loved this figure. <laughs> they, um, because they'd been trying to say this, <laughs> and this supported those, those ideas. 
Okay, now you can, considering the ones that are least important, the blue ones, this analysis is saying they're, they're not important individually, but are they, you could also ask the question as to whether they're important cumulatively. And we can eat, just do that uh, evaluation by t getting rid of 100 of them, so that's 20% of our head data set. And in that case, the standard deviation increased by 0.6%. So in this case, even cumulatively, those points aren't important. Okay, the next question is what new observations would be valuable to predictions? Um, and we considered head observations throughout layer one. There was some discussion in DOE as to if they, if they wanted to put in new wells, where might they go? Um, and here we, took, we used the OPS statistic and added one at a time. And as we went th throughout the grid then, every place uh, that we considered, we had to say how accurately we thought we could measure the water table there, and we based that mostly on what the slope of the contoured water table map was. And through that analysis, you can see that some areas are, 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 have very small values, the dark blue and the light blue, indicating that observations there wouldn't add much based on these model results, and that the red and, and uh, yellow areas that would add quite a lot. In fact, sometimes amounts that seem rather extraordinary, and one might, um, and, and personally, I mean, I don't take this verbatim, these are model results, you know, but I think they can provide some guidance as to what might be important. Okay, warning. <laughs> How much do I believe this? Um, the validity of this, of really anything, all the things that I talked about depends on the accuracy of the model and the model being linear. Okay, neither of which we ever completely achieve. Um, we evaluate li likely model accuracy using model fit, as I talked about for a little bit in guide light eight. Obviously, there's a lot more behind that. And the plausibility of optimized parameter values, as in guideline nine and knowledge of the simplifications and approximations that went into this model. Obviously, this is a grossly simplified version of what's out in the field, and there, there may be aspects of that simplification that clearly would affect the analysis, and one would need to think those through. Uh, this model is nonlinear, and in general, our groundwater models are nonlinear. And by nonlinear, I mean nonlinear with respect to the parameter values, okay? I don't mean whether the forward model's nonlinear. I mean whether the, whether the inverse model's nonlinear. Um, and all, all groundwater models are nonlinear. Uh, most models of natural systems are nonlinear, it seems like. Um, but these methods were found to be useful. What does that mean? What that means is that when we, put, for example, when we put together the composite scale sensitivity figure and then made some change to the model, all of a sudden we didn't find that what had been important wasn't important anymore and what was important wasn't unimportant is important, okay? We didn't get some global shift and it just kept really consistently throughout all the changes, the same basic features were important, the same basic features weren't important. Even though the actual value of the composite scale sensitivity changed, which you'd expect because of the nonlinearity. So that's what I mean by useful. If you make some change, little change to your model and that diagram completely changes, it means your model's too nonlinear for this analysis, okay? And you're stuck using other methods. <laughs> at least in that, and sometimes there's portions of the solution space you can use not lin you can use gradient these kind of methods and other places where you can't. But so you have to learn how that works. Um, and these methods just aren't useful if your models in an area where in a solution space where your model's too nonlinear. <clears throat> So, how does this relate to what we've done um, in the past? Generally, people use trial and error, and I think of trial and error as groping in the dark. If I turned out all the lights here, I could come in and figure out and, and grope around and figure out that there were long tables and that there were chairs and that there was carpet on the floor and that the, you know, I could figure out a lot about this room. And using the methods I'm talking about aren't like turning on bright lights, okay, and being able to look at the texture, in, you know, even the lights that are on now. It's not like being able to see the texture um, in the carpet. But it do, to my mind, it's more like turning on a night light, okay? You can see a little bit better, and I can guarantee you that it's a lot more fun to do calibration with this kind of stuff instead of just trial and error. So, I've talked to you about 14 guidelines. I think of them as organized common sense with some new pers perspectives and statistics. There's some things I've presented, I'm sure, where you've thought, well, I've seen things like that before, that's nothing new. And maybe other things that you think, hmm, hadn't thought of that. So, but it's all put together in one place for one thing, and um, there are some wrinkles that are new, I think. Um, they're oriented towards clearly stating and testing all assumptions. 
Um, they emphasize graphical displays that are statistically valid and informative to decision makers. Hopefully you have some better idea of what that mean by that now. My hope is that you go out of here thinking, gosh, maybe I can do a little bit more with my model and my data than I thought I could, okay, and get some more insight there. The things that I've shown you, um, except for the last part, all the programs are, are uh, documented, available, public domain. Um, the, uh, for the last analysis, that'll be out, the OPS statistic will be out at some point. It's not getting out very fast these days. Um, uh, but, and they're available at water.usgs.gov. Um, this is my email address if you're interested in these methods. Um, the documents are free, and at the moment we just had everything, almost everything reprinted, so we get, <laughs> I have something to give. Um, and uh, I'm not very fast at getting out back to my email these days, so I apologize for that, but if you are interested, I'm more than happy to address questions. And also, I'm interested in questions now, so thank you very much.